Welcome to Navigating the Unreality Podcast, a mystical perspective on being human. I'm Jean Marie, your host, and together we'll explore ideas about what this reality we share actually is, who are we as humans, and why are we here? Let's go deep and discuss ways to navigate this reality. Enjoy. In this episode, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Bob Lancer again. Now, today we're on a Skype connection from Georgia, USA to Down Under, so it does get a little bit patchy, but you'll get the gist of it. Today, we are talking about the mystical Kabbalah and the Tree of Life. Now, the Tree of Life is a schematic or a meditative symbol that represents the mystical story of the Kabbalah. And Bob, when I look at the Tree of Life, I see a sort of symbolic code that is an image of our esoteric reality. And I'd love for you to offer your understanding of what is the Kabbalah and what is the Tree of Life and how can it help us navigate our paths here in this earth realm? Well, as far as what it is, I, I could not describe it more eloquently and succinctly than you just did. <laughs> as, as far as how to apply it, that's kind of my specialty because I was trained in Kabbalah, you know, by an individual um, who, whose mastery was translating the wisdom teachings of the ages into practical daily life application. And right. so that's been sort of my gift when it comes to Kabbalah from the very beginning of my studies with it. It was always about making it practical and integrating it into my daily life. Um, so that it starts off with that intention, okay. a, a, a mistake, quote unquote, mistake that people make when it comes to Kabbalah is they become intellectually fascinated with it. So they yeah. want to know all the symbols and all the attributions and what the angels are and what this is. And, the, and by getting caught up in the intellect, you know, they get a head full of knowledge and maybe they get inspired by what they, you know, by the knowledge they gather, but there's no actual spiritual transformation taking place. And the spiritual transformation that takes place is the embodiment of the divine. So the tree of life represents the embodiment of the divine, which is the purpose and the potential of every human being, is to embody the divine. And that only comes by practicing, not by thinking, not by knowing, but by doing. Yeah. And can you just give us a really brief look into what the actual Kabbalah is? The actual Kabbalah. Yeah, I mean, like the tree of life is kind of like, you know, the symbol that encodes that. But for people that might not be familiar with Kabbalah, how could you kind of break that down? Like, what is um, it? You know, there are different perspectives on it. Um, one perspective, you look at the theosophical perspective, Kabbalah is the essential root spiritual tradition at the core of all spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. So if you drill down any spiritual tradition to its mystical core, you find Kabbalah. The basic okay. structure, function, order of the universe, as as described by Kabbalah. So that's that's one um, version of it. But the um, historical Kabbalah, if we trace back the Kabbalah historically, um, we go back to the first century, um, where legend has it that um, Simeon Bar Yohai was hiding out in a cave. And uh, I think it was <laughs> Ratziel occurred, appeared to him and taught him the Kabbalah. And the, the Kabbalah is, the, is, is, is and, that comes, and he, that comes through the tradition of Judaism. And right. So the Kabbalah, so if you look at Judaism, if you look at, let's say, Orthodox Judaism, it's very much about following these rules and regulations and ceremonial processes. And you sort of, you sort of give up your ego in order to become totally absorbed in following these daily laws, this way of living. Yeah. And that's how you connect to God. Right. But the Kabbalah, which is the mystical tradition of Judaism, is 
not about, it's about understanding the mystical meaning of all those laws and all those practices in order to have a direct experience of the divine, to literally embody the divine presence and to yeah. live in the divine life, to live the divine life. And so there's always been a kind of a conflict in Judaism between the Orthodox and the mystical. The Orthodox shuns, or at least used to, more and more it's opening up, but it used to shun Kabbalah because it says that's not the essence. Judaism is not about having a direct experience of God. It's about following God's laws, following the Torah. Yeah. Well, right? I guess you could say that about all the Abrahamic religions. Uh, yes, exactly. And there's a mystical dimension to all the religions. Even in, in, in Christianity, you have the Gnostics, who were about a direct experience of the Christ, and they they embraced Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. So, so and then you have the um, you have the Sufi with Islam. That's right. That's right. Yeah. This, you know, yeah. So there's a mystical tradition, and then if you if you look at indigenous cultures and indigenous religion, it's really all about a, a spiritual experience. If you go back to ancient Greece and the mystery wisdom tradition of the Eleusinian mysteries, for example. And it was all about, you know, you would drink the Kikion, which was basically a psychedelic drink, and you would go through this process being guided by a hierophant or a spiritual teacher. You'd have a confrontation, you'd have a near-death experience, and then your soul would transcend into the heavens and you'd directly connect with the divine mind. That was the spiritual, that was the religion of ancient Greece. It was yeah. about having a direct experience, you know, not beliefs, not believing something is true. Yeah. And now what we have going on in the world is we have this dichotomy. We have people who operate under direct spiritual experience, who follow their heart and attune to their souls. And then we have people who just believe in the power of belief. As long as my beliefs are right, I'm okay. Yeah. And also one thing I've noticed, Bob, is that, you know, the whole sort of sort of energy around the Kabbalah is also seen by a lot of people, particularly Christians, as something that is of the occult. You know, it's kind of almost been demonized or made spooky, <laughs> it is, it is, it is. <laughs> which I think is funny. But I mean, why do you think that happened? Why do you think it became well, occulted? Be, because if you get into Kabbalah, the church loses its grip on you. Yeah. You know, if you've been indoctrinated for the first six years of your life to believe that Jesus is the only way and anything else is going to send you to hell, yeah. and you deeply indoctrinated that in, in early childhood, it's going to be a major shift to, li to liberate yourself from that. Yeah. And to, be able to just follow your own true path. Kabbalah is about following your own true path. The top sphere on the tree of life is Ketha, which represents divine will, which yeah. is the perfect will for you to follow at any given time. Yeah. Not, you can't follow that will if you're caught up in tradition and, and, and institutionalized you know, religion. You've got to be clear of all that. And, and Christ said it. He said, you know, you've you, you got to just follow me directly. Yeah. So there are, and the thing, there's yeah, I was going to say, the thing is, too, that the whole occult issue is that, I mean, even occult, just the word occult just means hidden. But, you know, it's sort of like the Orthodox religions have kind of almost turned that into some kind of like spooky corner that you're never meant to turn over. You're never meant to go around there. <laughs> yeah. because, they're, they're, because they represent the ego and the ego yeah. is terrified of truth. That's how you know the difference between the ego and the true soul, the true self. The ego is always terrified of truth. They're so would you say that the uh, mainstream religions then, like Judaism and Christianity and Islam, do you think that those are all egoic institutions? To the, to the degree that they hold on to the power of belief, yeah. Yeah. To the degree yeah. that it's just about, well, you have to believe this way and follow this way, as opposed to open up to your own inner being. You yeah. have in you the capacity, the faculty for knowing the truth. Like the second sphere on the Kabbalah tree of life is wisdom. It's the mm -hmm. domination of wisdom. You have within you the capacity to connect with perfect wisdom right here and right now to know exactly what to do. You don't have to become egotistic about it. If you become egotistic about it, you're losing the path. But if you just open up to your own inner wisdom, you'll be guided perfectly. But the, the, you know, the external religions, they shun that. They say, no, you do what we tell you to do because they're all just cults. And if you don't yeah. do what we tell you to do, you're out of a group. Yeah. You, well, your family is going to disown you. Your friends are going to disown you. Your community is going to disown you. We're going to relate to you as if you're possessed by a demon. Yeah. 
Yeah, I hear you. Unless you disown disown them, <laughs> which is kind of what I did. I mean, I grew up in a Catholic family, so I mean, I very much appreciated all the just the ambiance of religion, but I just always found it to be such bullshit. You know, it just well, never it never resonated in my heart anywhere. Experiential. Yeah. You know, but if you if you went through the the rituals of the early church, which there's research scholarly research right now which has been finding that in the earliest, in the times of Christ, they were using magic mushrooms yeah, to open up and to have these yeah. different experiences. Yeah. So somehow it, it went from Christianity to churchianity, right? <laughs> and so now what that means is that there's a huge segment of the population that can be controlled through propaganda. Yeah. You're, not gonna, you're not gonna open up to, the truth is always love, right? The yeah. law is always hate. Yeah. So if you're ruled by propaganda, you are being programmed to hate and to fear and to oppose and to conflict, yeah. to humanize. Which pretty much, you know, is which pretty much is indicative of the mainstream consensus reality in our world. I would say it's about fifty-fifty. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I think there. I think it's about fifty-fifty. It's probably more like sixty-forty. Of sixty yeah. percent of the planet is actually awakening to the guidance of inner truth. Yeah. And this show is helping them to do that. And as we raise our own consciousness, the, the, the consciousness of the world is raised. You know, it's like it's like you know we talked about in our previous um, recorded conversation. You know, people talk about, oh, what, what happened in America when they were in the insurrection and they were invading the Capitol. Well, what happened in America was people woke up to the real <laughs> that they really do love democracy. Yeah. Yeah. And also, we don't know to what degree that was just theater. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. See, if you start trying to figure out what's going on outside of you, you've lost the path. Right. There's truth outside of you. Right. If you try to figure, well, did that really happen? Was it theater? Was it real? As soon as you go there, you're going, you're leaving the path. The path is inward. What are you creating? What is guiding you right now? How are you being affected by that thought? Mm -hmm. And as you seek the truth within, you're following the true path. When you start getting caught up in conspiracy theories and who's running the show and what's going on and how the whole economic thing, people, when they go into that place, you'll find there's always negativity that comes in to fill the void. Because yeah, it's a great big distraction, isn't it? That's all it is. It's a temptation. Yeah. Once you leave, once you leave to and go get involved intellectually in the outer world, you create a space within you for negative forces to come in and occupy. Yeah. So you never have to worry, you know, did they really land on the moon? Is 9-11 real? <laughs> as soon as you start going into that, you're going into fantasy, imagination, and belief. And if you just let that go and say, now, wait a minute, is this the best use of my attention right now? Is this yeah. what I need to be focusing on? Because whatever I send out, I get back. I want to be guided right now by God. I want to be guided by, in, in, in Kabbalah, the third sphere of the tree of life is true understanding. True understanding is internal. It's seeing what's going on inside of you, not what's going on outside of you. It's go, focusing on what's going on inside of you. And when you focus on what's going on inside of you, you're guided along the path on the tree of life. There's a pathway that connects understanding to beauty. Yeah. You follow what's going on inside of you. You're being guided to beauty. And then what comes after beauty on the tree of life is victory, mm -hmm. right? And so if you want to live a victorious life, follow the inward path. Makes yeah. sense? Makes sense. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 It makes sense. So it's always, you always want to catch yourself. You're trying to figure out what other people are up to, what your neighbor's up to, what your sister is up to, you know, what the government is up to. Whoa, 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 whoa. What am I up to? Yeah. She used to say in all things, M Y O B. <laughs> Mind your own business. That's right. <laughs> literally. That's literally right. You know, yeah. we said, you know, mind your own business. Stop minding mine. Yeah. So do you think then, you know, if you kind of, we sort of look at this tree of life as kind of a, a symbol that represents kind of the mystical playground of our reality here. Like, do you think that this sort of like outer world distraction, is that kind of like built into this realm as part of our, our well, training? 
That's sphere 10, Malkuth. Malkuth is the, is, the, is the tenth sphere, the bottom sphere of the tree of life. It represents the physical world. And mm-hmm. the physical world is nothing but an outer projection of the inner world. And right. So it's like what people are doing is they're walking into a magic mirror. They're walking into the mirror and they're getting caught up in the reflections. Yeah. It's living at the level of cause. And so part of the evolution of consciousness goes from the animal level of consciousness to the human level of consciousness to the divine level. So at the human level, and Nietzsche used to talk about this when he would talk about the Superman and we're, we're crossing over a bridge. So at the animal level of consciousness, the animal level of consciousness is totally identified with the outer world, with the physical world. That's how the animal survives. The dog smells, right? The dog listens, right? <laughs> and it follows it follows a trail, and, it, and if it sees food, it gets excited to eat the food, right? Yeah. But as a human being, you know, you could be looking at a beautiful, um, you know, like I love veggie burgers. So you could be looking at a beautiful veggie burger sitting right there on the plate in front of you. And you start to salivate and you want to eat it. And then somebody tells you, by the way, it's plastic. It's <laughs> now you just had an awakening that an animal not necessarily going to get. You start to realize, now, wait a minute, I can't trust my physical senses. And I can't even trust my desires because they're not necessarily based on the truth. So what? who am I really? What is my true will? What is the divine will? What is the kether within me? What is the true will that I am to follow in any given situation? A human being has the inner faculty to know that. In Kabbalah, there's a sphere that's not a sphere. It's not pictured on the tree of life. It's called the sphere that's not a sphere. It's called dat, D-A-T. In, in, in Hebrew, it's, it's pronounced dat. And what uh-huh. it represents is knowledge. But it doesn't represent head knowledge. It represents the, the potential of the human being to know divine will, divine mind, to actually experience that level of consciousness. And it's the ultimate urge of the human being to travel up the tree of life, to go from Malkut, the physical level of consciousness, not we went up to leave our bodies, but we awaken our consciousness to include our body, but to put our body in the context of the spiritual framework of the universe. And there's nothing you want more, nothing I want more, nothing any human being wants more than to awaken to the divine level. That's where all the joy is. That's where all the peace is. That's where all the love is. That's where yeah. all the power is. And that's what we really want to wake up. And when you in, when you meet or encounter a person or a book that sort of resonates with that energy, you realize, yeah, that's what I want. That's yeah. where I want my life to go. And then you tread the path. That's because you feel that sense of joy. Joy, realness, certainty. Yeah. It's just, yeah. just in knowing that you know what this is the truth, and this is this is what I really really want. And I, I don't, I'm not looking for you know public acclaim. I'm not trying to be famous. I'm not trying to be rich. I'm not trying to impress my neighbors. I'm not trying to get this. I'm not trying to get that. Because what I find is that as I raise my level into divine consciousness, my whole life starts to raise into a heavenly state. I don't have to try to make anything happen. It just automatically, the external world automatically reflects the inner world. So Malkuth, which is the Hebrew word for kingdom, which represents the kingdom of the physical manifest world, is nothing but a reflection. It's a mirage. It's an image. It's a projected image of your own internal state of consciousness. So as you let yourself be in joy, without trying to figure anything out, your whole life raises to a higher level because it reflects your higher vibration. Yeah. So is that kind of similar to what the Buddhists and the Zen call the illusion? Yeah, the Maya. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 we have to recognize, you know, if we if, have to figure out that the illusion is actually solid. <laughs> well, actually it's not. Actually, <laughs> anything you look at, right? Yeah. All you ever see. The only thing you can ever see in life is your own state of consciousness. Yeah. All you ever see is your perspective. Yeah. Right? So w- what we know from, from science, from physics, is that even a physical object, it just seems to be physical, but it's actually a dynamic energy process of electrons and neutrons. But the nerve endings in my skin are too slow to pick up the dynamic motion of it. So it gives me, it sends a message to my brain that gives me the experience of solidity, but it's all internal. Yeah. But all you ever experience is your state of consciousness. 
Mm-hmm. You can't experience anything but your state of consciousness. Everything is a manifestation of consciousness. Consciousness is all there is. Consciousness is God. Mm-hmm. And so as you expand and raise your level of consciousness, you start experiencing the world in a whole different way. It yeah, becomes- well, that's cer- certainly yeah. been my experience. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, what are the, what, what's the sort of purpose of the, the lines that connect the spheres? So in Kabbalah, it says that there are 32 paths of wisdom. And the 32 paths of wisdom consist of the 10 spheres or circles on the tree of life and the 22 lines or paths that connect the spheres. Mm-hmm. So, so each sphere is a divine emanation. And those divine emanations are within you. The, there's the divine emanation. An emanation means like radiance, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So within you is an emanation of divine will. So constantly at the very core, the deepest level of your being, there's a radiance of divine will, a knowing of what is truly right for you to do right now. That exists deep within you. It's emanating within you, right? And then sphere mm-hmm. two is wisdom. So there's always perfect wisdom emanating from within you. Sphere three is, 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 is understanding. So mm-hmm. true, true knowing, true understanding, true insight into the perfection of life is always emanating from within you. Sphere four is, is, is mercy, is, is the infinite, abundant benevolence of the divine that you can experience, the absolute benevolence. So if you ever feel frustrated or if you ever feel disappointed or if you ever feel anxious, it means you're operating from illusion because the reality is you're always going to be blessed with perfect love, perfect abundance. You never have anything to be concerned about. The only thing that can ever happen to you is what's exactly right for you. Yep. You never have to worry about anything. <laughs> the only thing that can ever happen is what's right for you. Sphere five is justice. So if you ever have a feeling of injustice or unfairness, you're looking at illusion. You drop that idea, drop that way of interpreting the situation. You always get exactly what's right for you. You always get back what you send out. And whenever you're going through a difficulty, it's just to 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 give you the opportunity to see how you're straying off the path. Sphere okay. six, beauty. That's the central sphere of the tree of life. That means that the ultimate reality is absolute unlimited beauty. And so if you practice the perspective of seeing everything as perfectly beautiful right now, if your life was absolutely perfectly beautiful and it was always going to be perfectly beautiful in every single way, how would you feel? Well, that's how to feel because that's what's going on. That's the awakening to what's going on. Sphere seven is victory. And victory means that there's no such thing as defeat. There's no such thing as failure. There's no such thing as a loss. There's no such thing as a letdown. Every single moment, the divine purpose is being fulfilled by what happens. You are always victorious. Sphere eight is glory, which is the perfection that just glows from the universe, the realization of how perfect everything is, the glory of God, the glory of creation, the glory of yourself. You are a sacred, holy being. Never entertain for a moment any idea of yourself as being less than perfect in every way. Now, that doesn't mean you walk around feeling better than other people, because you have to share that with other people. Mm -hmm. So you're condescending or looking down on another person. You're stuck in illusion. Everybody that we deal with, there's nothing but perfection in the universe. There's nothing but beauty and glory. Sphere 9 is the foundation, which represents the eternal nature of these truths. You are an eternal being. Death is an illusion. Death is imaginary. Yes, the body runs down. We set it aside. And then we ascend into a higher level of consciousness until we're ready to come back down and learn more lessons down here. But this whole process, this is eternal. You're an eternal being. The foundation of of reality is its eternal nature. The foundation of God is eternal nature. Now, when you live consistent with these principles, and you stay tuned into these principles more and more, you manifest sphere 10, the kingdom of heaven on earth. And that's what sphere 10 is. So the Kabbalah tree of life represents the divine emanations within you that you can follow to manifest heaven on earth. And that's what you're here to do. (laughs) And you said that the, um, you said at the start of the chat that the original information was actually given to us by an angel. It was uh, yeah. I mean that's that's the tradition. Kabbalah, the, the 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 Kabbalah was God's way of giving humanity a way to navigate through this plane. It's the plan. 
Yeah. It's the plan. Now, you don't ever have to learn Kabbalah. You can find your way without it. It's a tool that can enhance your journey if you feel a sense of, of, of affinity with it. I've always had an affinity with it. Mm-hmm. But you don't need Kabbalah. All you need is self-awareness. Yeah. And the pathways, so there are 10 spheres, and then there are 22 pathways. Mm-hmm. And the, um, the, the 22 pathways plus the 10 spheres represent the 32 paths of wisdom. So the 22 pathways are the channels through which the energy of each emanation travels. and Right. Mid- right? So okay. what you're looking at is a kind of a circulatory system. When you look at the Kabbalah tree of life, you're looking at an x-ray of your own inner being. And mm-hmm. it's an image of your circulatory system. Just letting your attention dwell on the tree of life and opening up to feelings of balance and harmony and integration, spiritual integration with the divine can help you to feel that sense of balance because it's an image of, of the balance. And yeah. each one of the pathways is represented by a Hebrew letter. And each one of the Hebrew letters has a mystical meaning. And that mystical meaning is portrayed um, to, in, in, a, in a very effective way through a certain version of tarot images. Yes. We use the B-O-T-A tarot images, right, which represent the Kabbalistic principles. So the tarot, every single path on the tree is symbolized by one of the 22 major arcana of the tarot. Mm-hmm. That was fascinating because what each image of the tarot, and again, it depends on the version, but the BOTA version, the Kabbalistic version that we use, each image represents a higher level of consciousness. It represents an integration of the spheres into your way of being. And as you observe and pay attention to the images, your subconscious is literally transformed to produce the state the image represents. Right. So the image liberates us from lower programming, liberates us to higher realization. Right. So from that point of view, too, I mean, I've found that even just looking at the tree of life is a very meditative energy for me. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't have your I don't have quite your intellectual understanding of the symbol, but just by looking at it, I feel a certain sense of just kind of knowing if that makes sense. (laughs) That's the sign that, that, you know, Kabbalah to some whatever degree it is for you, that you resonate with it, that it yeah. speaks to you, it connects you, it, it connects you to your soul. Yeah. And that's all it's, it's funny. about. Yeah. Now, did you, did you grow up in a Jewish community? I grew up in a Jewish community, but it was really just Jewish culturally to some degree. Yeah. It was Orthodox. Most, it, no, it was, it, it was, you know, atheistic. Nobody really believed in God. There was no spirituality. Um, yeah. It was just, you know, you eat bagels and locks on Saturdays. That was about it. (laughs) Wow. Okay. Isn't that amazing? Like, how did we get to this point where all these beautiful, beautiful mystical traditions just, you know what I mean? Just have become like overrun with just intellectual stuff that just means nothing anymore. Well, I I mean, when when I was a kid, I, I was totally starved spiritually and I became very suicidal. I was extremely depressed. But once I found the, the the esoteric path, once I found these these deeper teachings, this way of looking at the universe and living in 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 with consistency, living consistently with the laws of the universe, I mean, I was just fed on the light. I'm like a moth. I just I just feed on the light. Yeah. And so I just you know all day long, all I'm doing is either teaching this stuff, reading this stuff, meditating. And my whole life is oriented toward just feeding on more and more light. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it just feels so good, doesn't it? It it does. It, it to me, it's like like food. You know, there, there's an old story of um, it, there was a guru, and there was someone who wanted to 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 study with the guru, to, to for the guru to wake him up. And the guru said, "Okay, if you want to be my student, come with me." And he took him to a lake, and the guru walks into the lake about waist, waist deep, and he calls in this, this the the fellow who wants to work with him. And so the fellow stands right next to him. And before the fellow knows what is going on, the guru grabs him by the shoulders and holds him under the water. And holds him <laughs> under the water until all the bubbles are coming up. He, he's just about to die. And he pulls him up out of the water. 
And the guru says to the to the would be disciple, he says, "Now, when you were under the water, what did you want more than anything else?" And the and the would be disciple says, "I wanted air." And he said, "When you want to wake up as much as you wanted air, I can help you." <laughs> That's a great story. That's really good. Point. Yeah, it's just about it's just about wanting. When you're really fed up with living in suffering and fear and worry and pressure and feeling burdened by debt, feeling burdened by any aspect of life, if you're tired of not feeling complete and total joy, the deeper wisdom is for you. This is this is the path of liberation. And as you know, you know, I guide people through a simple process called the method which liberates you from your suffering very quickly. But then it's a matter of practicing living consciously so you recognize when you're bringing yourself down. There's yeah. nothing about life that's imperfect. Life is perfectly balanced. The tree of life is a balanced system. There are three pillars, the male pillar, the female pillar, and the union between. Mm -hmm. And the perfection of balance means in, if you look at the universe, it's all balanced. The solar system is balanced. The galaxy is balanced. Right, a tree that stands is balanced. Every it's all balanced. So balance means that wherever there's a need, the means to meet that need exists. You always get what you need. There's mm -hmm. nothing to worry about. But if you worry, what happens is now we go into the darker lands, and that is, you manifest consistently with how you think and feel. Mm -hmm. So if I start worrying, let's say I worry about money, why would I worry about money if I'm, no matter what happens, no matter what I do, I can't escape the balance of the universe. I can only get exactly what I need. But if I'm worried about it, if I'm worried, now I'm putting myself in an alternate universe. <laughs> I'm putting myself in, a, in hell. Yeah. Right? I'm putting myself in hell because I'm living as if my needs might not be met. Yeah, and then you're creating what you don't want. Then I'm creating it. That's the power yeah. of human beings. So we're here to learn how to master our creative forces, to align our creative forces with the tree of life. If all you can ever experience is victory, you must clear out of any fear of failure because it's illusory. Or if you ever feel like you're not good enough or not worthy, you got to clear that out and get into the, to the sphere of glory where all you are is the glory of divine. You are you are part of the universe. The universe is a glorious, infinite, uh, 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 magical, mystical, miraculous experience. <laughs> and that's what you are. I know, and that's exactly how I see it, Bob. <laughs> well, people, I do, I do. I share people, your vision. A lot of people don't see themselves that way consistently. Yeah. That's yeah. where the work comes in. That's the challenge. Realizing where you're veering off course internally. Yeah. No person outside of you is ever your problem. There's nothing you have to fight, nothing you have to rebel against. Right? You, all the power is within you. You are a divine being. The emanations of the divine are within you. There's no separation unless you believe there's one and imagine one. Yeah. You're an infinite divine being. You create, you reap what you sow, not what other people sow. There's nothing to fight against, nothing to feel depressed about, nothing to feel frustrated about, no one to feel better than, no one to feel worse than. You are absolutely perfect, flawless, and infinitely empowered. And it's just learning how to recognize how to use your power wisely instead of using your power to manifest sickness, unhappiness, problematic relationships, unfulfilling career. You can stop all of that stuff. You can let go of all of that stuff as you wake up. Yeah. And so the tree of life is just one of many little mystical symbols that we have here in this earthly realm to help us understand this process. Right, right. And, yeah. and, and the way Kabbalah yeah. describes a human being, a human being is like a tree with roots in heaven and fruit upon the earth. Yeah, and that's lovely. You're rooting yourself in heaven. You have the capacity for true spiritual knowing. Yeah. It's not just logic. You don't base your choice on logic, emotion, or desire. You have to get into a centered place and go within and open up to the higher spiritual guidance you're getting and then follow that spiritual guidance and it'll always be perfect. Yeah. It's never wrong. Yeah. Remember, you find yourself, you can't find yourself in the wrong place. It's impossible. Yeah. It doesn't exist. 
Mm -hmm. but go into the realm of delusion and think you're in the wrong place and then experience that as your reality. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, can I ask you quickly about your Kabbalah cards? Oh, yeah, yes, yes. The Kabbalah because, cards. Yeah, yeah I've been, I bought those from you um, a couple of months ago and I've been working with them now pretty regularly and I love them. I think they're fantastic. I and do I, was too. Just, I was just wondering what sort of inspired you to put that deck together. Well, it was back in about 1987 or 88, something like that. Um, there's this there's this aspect of Kabbalah called placing matters on the tree. And so it's a way of interpreting what happens in terms of the tree of life, seeing where the different emanations and the different paths come into play. But no one knows how to do that. They know that yeah. the practice existed but there's no teaching about how to do the practice. And as I was meditating one day, all of a sudden it just hit me. And the Kabbalah cards, the whole system just occurred in my mind. I was just sitting at my desk and all of a sudden I saw how to place matters on the tree. And the whole, the whole <laughs> cards that just came to me, I took the back of business cards and I drew what the images that you see on the Kabbalah cards, I drew them. So there are 32 Kabbalah cards for the 10 spheres and the 22 paths. Mm -hmm. I asked the question, I shuffled the cards, I pulled the card, and all of a sudden my intuition just flowered. And I realized what the card was telling me was true. Right. And uh, I, I was in a relationship with someone at the time who was a psychotherapist. I drew a set of cards for her. I said to start using them with clients, and they worked for her. And then eventually I just published them, and they've been published around the world. They've been published in several languages. Um, and it's just a way of communing with your higher self. The tree of life is really the, the structure of your true divine nature. Mm -hmm. And when you use Kabbalah cards, you're getting into communion with that higher potential, that higher nature. Yeah. That's why I like them so much. It just, it helps me stay, stay connected. And it's a feeling of companionship. Yeah. And it's also a really good way just to introduce yourself and become familiar with you know, some of the terms like mercy and foundation and beauty on a different level. Because, I mean, those words are like, you know, really beautiful, beautiful words that are kind of not really understood in our modern world. Right. You know, I mean, even the word mercy, I mean, that is such an amazing word. Like whenever I hear that, I'm just like, right. wow, you know, I mean, and right. I, don't, I don't even think most people would even understand what that is, you know. They don't, they don't. But it's, you know... The, the more the more higher consciousness that we emanate, it's like marinating the human race. The human race right now is being marinated in higher consciousness, <laughs> right? And just like you put a meatball in the sauce and soon the meatball tastes like the sauce. Yeah. The person in, in, in the sphere of higher consciousness and soon they start their own higher consciousness starts <clears throat> from within. And that's that's what's going on Right now, there's a there's a true separation. The people who are following the spiritual path that is guiding you from within. It's not nothing external. Mm -hmm. They are finding that doors of opportunity are open. Things are just flourishing in their lives. They're finding more joy, more success, and more God because they're finding everything happening miraculously. See, in Kabbalah, what you learn how to do is you learn how to access higher power, higher love, higher joy, higher intelligence. So yeah. if you're operating, you can work really, really hard to try to make stuff you want happen, but you're operating at a certain level of power. So let's take a car, for example. I can drive a car, put my foot all the way down on the accelerator, and the car will go so fast, but it's not going to go as fast as a jet plane because the jet yeah. is operating with higher power. Yeah. Kabbalah opens you up to higher power flowing through you. Now, you have to go through a purification process so that higher power doesn't empower lower, pa no, lower patterns. But as yeah. you go through that purification process, higher power flows through you. This higher power is divine in nature. All power is divine. It's divine in nature. It's loving. It's intelligent. And it's omnipotent. So just by opening yourself up right now, if you can feel who's listening to this, if you can feel a sense of higher energy flowing through you, just open up to it and let it flow through you. It in and of itself is an electromagnetic field that's forming the circumstances of your life at a higher level. <laughs> okay, well, I certainly feel it. Yeah, I just knocked over some stuff. 
<laughs> now, do you actually do um, Kabbalah readings for people, or do you just do that as part of the method? Or I, I, I mean, just, you know, like like typically when I'm on a call, I'll go through phases when I'll do it. Well, I'll just pull a card to see what does this person need, right? And I won't even necessarily tell them I'm doing it. I'm just using it to help me tune in. Okay, gotcha. Right? Um, but there was a time when I was doing a lot of Kabbalah. I, I used to I'd do Kabbalah life readings for people. I, when I lived in New Hampshire, um, here in the States, I would be, be invited throughout the Northeast. They would invite me to parties, and I'd sit there at a table, and I'd just do Kabbalah readings for people. And they'd pay me a lot of money, and they'd have these wonderful experiences with Kabbalah. Yeah. Well, Kabbalah reading, you know, anyone who gets the cards can can do a Kabbalah reading for anybody. Yeah. I mean, oracle cards are just like such huge business now because so many people are, you know, looking for keys and looking for codes. And I just think that um, that whole side of your offering is pretty amazing. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I, what I love, one of the things I love about the Kabbalah cards is that as far as I can tell, they're the simplest system out there. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's just numbers, you know, it's just very simple, but somehow they resonate at such a deep soul level. Yeah. And uh, they're just, a, they're just a method again for just opening up to the inner guidance. That's always available. Beauty, right? Follow yeah. the sense of beauty all day long. Most people don't do that. They follow the sense of drudgery. <laughs> yeah. Follow that's kind of sad. Folly, well, again, if you're feeling any sadness at all, do the method on it because yep. there's nothing going wrong. Everybody's getting what they need. Yeah. Right. And you're getting what you need. If you're confronted with someone who's unconscious, that's perfect for you right now. Mm -hmm. Right. And so as we release ourselves from our attachment to misery, we find joy just naturally bubbling up. Yep. And what I teach, I call it the new wisdom of joy, which mm -hmm. joy works. Happy, Absolutely. Love works. And so follow the sense in the Kabbalah, tune in every moment. If you get too caught up in the outer world, my teacher used to say everybody's ruled by three things, the bed, the belly, and running around. <laughs> and if you just slow down and tune in, you can get a sense of what really is the right thing for you to do right now. And that right thing for you to do right now will produce beauty and victory and honor in your life and will provide for you. The foundation represents providence. You're always going to be perfectly provided for. And yeah. then you follow this path. You start manifesting automatically, spontaneously, the kingdom of heaven on earth. And you realize, you know, like Deepak Chopra, uh, you know, was once asked, where do we go when we die? And he said, you're already there. <laughs> like Christ said, the kingdom of heaven is spread upon the earth right now. You are in heaven right now. You already passed away. You're there now. The only difference is time. So it takes a yeah. little bit more time for your thoughts to manifest. Mm -hmm. But whatever you think and whatever you feel determines what manifests in your life. And you don't have to try to focus on what you want to manifest. Just free yourself from manifesting what you don't want. And you discover that the laws of heaven are right here. Nobody gets away with crime with lying, with stealing. They'll, get, they'll seem to be getting away with it for a while, but that's just to give them enough rope so that they go as far into hell as they need to go until they realize that they found themselves in hell. And now <laughs> they get out. And the way out, in, in Kabbalah, there's a saying, the gates of Teshuvah, Teshuvah means return. The gates of Teshuvah are always open. All you got to do is open up to God wherever you are and you start coming out. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I think that's fantastic. And I, you know, as I said, I grew up in a kind of a Catholic community and family. And when I was a teenager, my dad married a Jewish woman and they gave me this necklace for my, my birthday. And it was actually the tree of life. And I never really knew what it was at the time. And, you know, it was years later that I wound up looking that symbol up. But I mean, I wore that necklace for years and years and years and always had it like right next to my heart. And now that I've met you and I've bought the couple of cards and I've been sort of delving into it a bit more, it's sort of all making sense. Well, obviously that was a gift from a past life. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I can, I don't even know what happened to that necklace, but I can still see it in my mind's eye and how much That's I loved it. 
Well, then it's still there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Bob. Oh, uh, well, it's always a pleasure. <laughs> so anytime you want to chat about anything, I'm always happy to, uh, to, to, to work with you and to, to generate light together. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate your time today. And um, we'll look forward to talking with you again soon. Okay, beautiful. Thank you, Jean Marie. Okay, thanks, Bob. Bye bye. Thanks for tuning in. My website is jeanmarie.space, where you'll discover all episodes of Navigating the Unreality. Feel free to message me with comments and feedback, and you are welcome to donate to my podcast. All amounts are sincerely appreciated. See you next time. This is a sacred place. There is beauty here. And peace and peace and peace and grace and grace and grace. This is a sacred place.